Hey guys, welcome to Cake World Cambridge. I'm Aisha and you're watching Chapter 21, Human Influences on Ecosystems. This is officially the last chapter for IGCSE Biology and I can't wait to get it done with. I know I'm delayed a lot. I've procrastinated. I was supposed to post all of these by the June attempt of 2022, but I didn't have time and now I finally do. So yeah, let's get started. And yes, it is the longest chapter, at least was in my textbook. But um, trust me, when it comes to making the PowerPoint, it was actually pretty short. You just have to memorize a few points that you can use in a lot of answers. Okay, so just remember those and you should be good for your four mark questions. Let's get started. Okay, so you, you're, the first thing that your syllabus um, says about this chapter is that you should state that modern technology can increase food production by these methods. Now, what are these methods? One is agricultural machinery. That's pretty obvious to use larger areas of land and it improves efficiency. Then you have fertilizers, which improve crop yields. As you know, fertilizers are like chemicals, like NPK fertilizers. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizers that are sprayed on um, or added to soils to provide nutrients to soils that plants can um, absorb, like take in and like, um, provide greater yields of um, fruit or crop or whatever. Then we have insecticides that improve quality and yield insecticides. Um, and then we have herbicides that reduce competition with weeds. So what do insecticides and herbicides do? So insecticides basically when sprayed on to a plant, they only affect the insects that feed on the plant. So when the insects are um, um, obliterated or destructed or like, you know, removed, killed basically from the plant, then the plant is able to grow more and produce a greater yield that can be used by humans instead of having insects feed on them or pests. And then we have herbicides that are basically sprayed on that only target weeds that grow in between plants or whatever. So when the herbicides act on weeds, they kill weeds. So these weeds, so when there's less weeds in the soil, there's less competition for resources and nutrients between the weeds and the actual crops. So the weeds are killed, so all the nutrients can be diverted and used by the crops. So there's reduced competition with weeds. And then we have selective breeding, as we've learned in chapter 18, I think, or 17 that um, helps to um, improve um, production by crop and livestock. So you can choose crop with desirable characteristics or features, breed them together, and then obtain desired um, products. That's basically it. So just remember these points. You don't have to remember my explanation. You just have to understand my explanation, and that in turn will help you to mark up these points. Okay, monocultures. Okay, so the, now this PowerPoint has a lot of lists of points that you have to memorize. And I'm sorry for that, but trust me, it'll help you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to screenshot these slides or come back and view this video again if you want. Screenshotting is kind of more convenient. So screenshot it and kind of memorize it. It helps. So monocultures. What is a monoculture? Monoculture is basically when a whole area of um, a field is um, cleared out. And so only one kind of crop or plant is grown in that whole field, okay? Like intensively, like all resources are diverted towards that crop growth or production. So basically, what are the negative impacts of monocultures? So one, deforestation. As I explained to you, monocultures is when land is cleared to grow these crops. So to clear land, you have to cut down trees and that is deforestation. Then there's a loss of habitat because there are many organisms that live amidst these trees or boreal, terrestrial or whatever organisms that have habitats and homes in these forests or woodlands. And so when they are cleared, they lose their habitat. So there's a loss of habitat. There's a loss of biodiversity because only one kind of crop is grown in these monocultures. Um, there's soil erosion. What is soil erosion? It is basically the weathering away of soil. So the quality of the soil decreases. It gets destroyed basically. Soil erosion occurs because basically the presence of trees helps to prevent soil erosion because you know, um, kind of holds the soil together, you know, when there are like trees present on soil, yeah. Um, it disrupts nutrient cycles, um, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, all of this is disrupted. So, how is the nitrogen cycle disrupted? Plants absorb nitrate ions, there are nitrogen fixation, fixing bacteria in root nodules, all of them go so the nitrogen cycle won't be able to function properly. And um, then we have the water cycle. How are trees involved in the water cycle? 
transpiration and the formation of clouds. Um, then we have um, desertification. What is desertification? It is when the texture of soil, the quality of soil becomes so bad that it can't hold any water in it. Water is like it can't absorb any water. And it becomes like hard. No water can seep into the ground. That's what happens, desertification. Um, desertification is also kind of like a result of soil erosion. So, yeah. Then the spread of crop disease and pests. So when you have like one monoculture, one disease or one pest can cause a disease, a pathogen can cause a disease that basically can wipe out the whole um, crop because all the crop grown are identical, they're like clones pretty much. So one disease like the start in this, or the onset of a disease can just wipe away the whole um, field of crops and so the disease can spread really quick. Um, then we have the use of herbicides, pesticides and insecticides. So as yes, these, these, these are good, but they also kill non-target species. So they may kill other useful insects or other useful organisms in the soil that help plow the soil or whatever. So that is a negative impact. Then there's a pollution of waterways by fertilizers because eutrophication. So, oh yeah, this comes in an MCQ before I forget. Fertilizers and untreated sewage both cause um, eutrophication to occur. In an MCQ. I'm not, if I'm not, mis it is in an MCQ. I know I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, so pollution of waterways like lakes and rivers by fertilizers. I'll explain that to you later because there's a whole chunk dedicated to that. Then there's, a, there's pollution of atmosphere. So, fertilizers have nitrogen and whatever. So, nitrogen dioxide is kind of released or it reacts to form like, like after denitrification, nitrogen forms, then nitrogen dioxide forms. NOx, X basically stands for any number. So if NOx forms, then it can cause pollution in the atmosphere and acid rain if it dissolves in rainwater. And then there's the pollution. So some machines need fuel, right? And if they use fossil fuels, what are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are basically um, fossilized um, plants or whatever that have, like, you know, sunk into the soil and then fossilized over centuries of years. And when they are burnt, they release energy. So what happens is when they are burnt, when they use just fuels and burnt, they also produce toxic harmful gases. And so that kind of causes air pollution as well. So yeah, that's another form of pollution. So I'd say memorize at least six of these because this could come max to max for a six marker and you don't lose your marks here because this chapter, you just have to mug up these points. So now a lot of these points I repeated in other slides. So it's not very difficult. Okay, just I just had to explain all of these to you for now. Okay, captive breeding. What is captive breeding? Captive breeding is when you enclose a set of species inside like boundaries and breed them there. So captive breeding is also actually a solution to prevent extinction because supposing that supposing there are organisms or tigers, let's say tigers, that are going to get extinct. So to continue the population and to prevent extinction, these tigers can be bound, okay, in like a natural reserve and bred there. And like the population can be increased there without any competition for resources, without any predation, without any climate change, without habitat destruction, nothing. So they can be bred there under idealistic conditions and then the populations can be restored, not to the original number, but to a sufficient number. So that is what captive breeding is. So the negative impacts, one, animals are killed by predators. So yeah, this could happen. Like if you're going to captively breed two, organic, two species together and one is prey, one is predator, that could happen. Um, unable to find food, more prone to disease and portrait. Um, what happens is, after, so what happens is sometimes, um, like after an organism has been captively bred and then is released out, like when the population numbers are restored, um, what happens is these animals may, not, may be so used to being like given everything on a silver plateau in the reserve that they may find it hard to survive on their own. It's basically adaptation, like that all of it changes. So they become unable to find food because they don't know how to work for it. Um, they can be poached later. Um, they're more prone to diseases. And obviously there's reduced genetic variation because if you're gonna like breed a certain number and like certain um, tigers, let's say certain organisms together, then the, there's gonna be less variation. But if you have like, tiger, like tigers from all over or organisms from all over breeding together in the open, like instead of a enclosed bound reserve, there is more biodiversity. And yeah, when they, and if new species are introduced into the arrangement, then there's more competition with them. And that kind of defeats the purpose of captive reading, but it is a disadvantage. Um, harmful effects of intensive livestock production. 
um now what is this um so okay basically these are all mark scheme answers okay i used to note them down when i was in 10th so i think memorize them because you will actually get marks for these these are proper mark scheme answers okay so harmful effects of intensive livestock production what is intensive livestock production that is when you have like cattle or something like that kind of species like a lot of chickens or something um like cattle I'm just going to go for cattle grazing together on one like patch of soil okay but like a lot of them so there's a high density of them on that one patch of soil and it's only filled with them okay so it's a very intensive process okay it's like a monoculture but for animals yeah so again you have the effects of waste on waterways fertilizers but this is not fertilizers this could be other uh, nutrients that you give them like food stuff waste their own waste could um, run into waterways okay that is one then disease has disease spread to humans um you will learn this in grade 11 so basically what happens is if an animal is infected um and uh, oh i think we did this in chapter 10 diseases yeah and if like so the butcher comes and like is like cleaning up the dead animal and then the pathogen spreads to the human and then again so the whole transmission cycle begins so that's how diseases spread then antibiotic it's not use of it's just antibiotic resistance so if all of the animals are fed like antibiotics to prevent um, disease because it's an, an intensive pro, um, pro, pro process um they're given antibiotics to prevent disease and death and everything so if too much of that is if there's an overuse of antibiotics then there could lead to resistance and everything and then antibiotics are not effective anymore and that causes a whole other issue and then we have the use of pesticides again and the loss of biodiversity because it's only like one kind of like organism like cattle like just cattle and then um there's a release of greenhouse gases so basically green methane methane is a greenhouse gas ch4 you probably learned this in camp so ch4 it's an organic gas it is um a greenhouse gas it is basically released from animal waste or rice paddy fields you have to know these two they very often ask you for two mark for where how is methane released from rice paddy fields or animal waste feces so basically um the feces can release um methane which is a greenhouse gas which then causes the greenhouse effect which we will get into later then there's global warming which is a result of the greenhouse effect monocultures are also used simultaneously with intensive livestock production habitat loss again because land is being cleared only for this livestock production and then there's an inefficient use of energy as we have done in chapter 19 where we realized that the higher the trophic level the lower the proportion of energy received by the organism so um if you're going to feed animals in livestock production a lot of nutrients and then um it make humans like consume the animals when dead and cooked then um there's less energy going to them than it would have gone to humans if it was directly from a plant so again inefficient use of energy okay soil erosion harmful effects okay so soil erosion weathering away of top soil um it causes silting of rivers because when it weathers away it flows down with rain into rivers and then like there's a deposit or a sedimentation of the soil in rivers so basically rivers with water get filled with soil instead so they become silted like they get as a layer of silt and landslides i told you the soil is not strong enough it doesn't have any anchorage so roots are not there for trees to hold it together so the soil washes away with water and that's a landslide flooding happens because the soil is eroded then it can't hold any water so water settles on top of it and that is flooding increased evaporation um uh, of water um desertification so it can't hold any water so it becomes hard and like impenetrable um reduced transpiration so because there are less trees there's less transpiration so less water vapors formed in the air and as a consequence there's reduced cloud formation as well because of the reduced cloud formation there are change in rainfall patterns why because cloud formation and the step after cloud formation is basically precipitation which is rainfall um because of the change in rainfall patterns plants don't grow because plants don't grow soil becomes infertile and then there is a loss of habitat because all the organisms that lived in the soil can't live under the prevalent conditions because it's infertile there's no nutrients then after that there's a disruption of food chain because there's loss of habitat because animals die and then there is less nutrient recycling or the nutrient cycles are disrupted that could lead to extinction because a lot of organisms die they can't make it because of the disrupted food chains okay and then we have the effects of herbicides as i already explained to herbicides are used to primarily kill weed 
So one is increased crop yield, which is a good thing because it kills wheat. There's less competition between the wheat and the crops. So the crops can use all the nutrients once the wheat are killed and produce a greater yield of whatever it had to produce um, because of yeah, there were competition with wheat. However, it could kill water plants if washed away into rivers. There could be a lack of produce from them. And then there's bioaccumulation. So what happens is sometimes organisms may consume the herbicide. And then these organisms are consumed by other organisms in the food chain. So this herbicide collects in the next organism in the next trophic level. And then this uh, organism is consumed by another. So this bioaccumulation occurs and the concentration of the herbicide increases each time because they may also consume the herbicide like on their own and also get it from the other organism. And that could lead to death, reduced biodiversity and extinction. Causes of famine. Okay, what is famine? Famine is basically when there's not enough food. There's a um, shortage of food, which um, leads to hunger and everything. Um, yeah, so now what are the causes of famine? So one is unequal distribution of food. That is the rich countries, the high, more developed countries get a large proportion of food and the ones and the poorer countries don't, lower, lesser developing economies get less food. So there's a shortage of food there and so famine. A uh, war. That could lead to the destruction of um, crop and fields and everything. And also, again, it could also lead to unequal distribution of food. Then poverty. Some people can't afford food. Lack of water. When there's a lack of water, basically, obviously, crops can't grow. And when they don't grow, they don't produce like um, food. Uh, then lack of irrigation systems that basically fertilize. Okay. Like basically catalyze um, the growth of crop. Then a drought. That is basically when um, there's less rainfall, when there's no rainfall, actually, um, that's a drought. Um, and because of that, again, lack of water and um, crops can't grow. Increasing population. So sometimes it's not because there's less supply of food. Sometimes it's because there's a greater demand from people. So there are too many people and insufficient food that causes famine. Flooding, that could destroy crops. Lack of seeds, not enough to plant and so less food, less crops. High cost of machinery, so that means um, a great smaller yield of crops will be um, available because as we already did in the first slide, improved uh, machinery helps to increase the production, helps to increase the yield of crops. But if it's high costing machinery, then people can't afford the machinery, they can't buy it. And so they can't produce that many crops. I think there'll be more causes of this in your textbook. You can go through it. It's not very important. Just no war, poverty. Um, drought, increasing population, flooding, these and unequal distribution of food. These were in the syllabus. So yeah, memorize them. Okay. Habitat destruction. So why is a habitat destroyed? Habitat of an organism destroyed. So one for um, crop growth that is monocultures and um, light intensive livestock production and housing for people like us. Like they cut down. Like even here, like in my locality they cut down so many areas and so many trees to build houses and stuff it's kind of sad yeah then extraction of natural resources so sometimes you have um mines or whatever in these kind of places where there's like a lot of nature and sometimes that the while extracting these resources then as a result very sadly and unfortunately everything around kind of gets destroyed so yeah then marine pollution that is when you're throwing um, you're basically littering um, waterways and then um, altering food is okay. Yeah, this is just an extra point that you have to know that you could be able to state through altering food webs and food trains, humans can have a negative impact on habitats. Okay, so that is one that is like introducing new species um, artificially into like a setup that could cause like a, that has a negative impact on habitats, which causes habitat destruction. Okay, negative impacts of deforestation. Deforestation is the removal of trees. Um, you should write that, right? Deforestation is the removal of trees. I think you get a mark if I'm not mistaken, but write it anyways. So one is soil erosion. Then we have flooding. We have extinction of organisms, loss of soil, desertification, increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We've done this already because basically plants use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. But if trees are cut down, then there are less trees. 
then less photosynthesis occurs so less carbon dioxide is taken in so more carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere which causes an enhanced greenhouse effect which causes global warming as a result see just from one point you can think of so many other points which actually give you marks so again loss of soil desertification flooding soil erosion like try to connect them and they're all very similar again negative impact of deforestation um different uh, loss of cloud cover change in rainfall patterns you know all those kind of things okay next pollution so i'm just going to go through a few pollutants yeah this is pretty easy now when i look at it but yeah okay so when we have sulfur dioxide it causes acid rain how is sulfur dioxide released so basically sulfur can be found in fossil fuels when these fossil fuels are fossil fuels are burnt sulfur um, may be released into the air if it reacts with oxygen it forms sulfur dioxide if it reacts again with oxygen it forms sulfur trioxide if it dissolves in rain water it forms sulfurous acid and consequently acid rain and so when acid rain falls what does it do it lowers the lake ph it kills marine organisms leaching of nutrients um, mobilizing of aluminium ions those kind of things it's not good at all so same thing nitrogen oxides um yeah nitrogen oxides that those can come from lightning because lightning causes um nitrogen and oxide to fuse to get like to chemically um react together because of high temperature so yeah nitrogen oxides also form acid rain and also uh, nitrogen oxides form in the engine of a car because of high temperature and pressure available then methane and carbon dioxide greenhouse gases because of the greenhouse effect and air pollution um, methane is found in rice paddy fields and in um, feces carbon dioxide when we breathe out the spiraling that's literally all it takes to form carbon dioxide and um, burning fossil fuels etc then insecticides herbicides nuclear fallout and untreated sewage water pollution and eutrophication yeah this is important the last one we have some so there are some hormones called female contraceptive hormones which basically promote um the female reproductive system to produce hormones like um um luteinizing hormone um progesterone estrogen fsh and everything so basically when these hormones are consumed okay and if supposing they enter like a water body it causes water pollution and then it could cause feminization of aquatic um, organisms and it could lower their sperm count and therefore cause an imbalance in population because there may be more female organisms than male organisms okay that's important eutrophication this is so important taken directly from your syllabus okay what is eutrophication so basically let's start with a fertilizer there's a farmer he uses fertilizer npk fertilizer so it has nitrogen nutrients okay there's rainfall so the rainfall washes the fertilizer away from the soil into a water body a river nearby so there is so these night this night these nitrate ions are washed away into the river these nitrate ions obviously have good properties like they're like fertilizers right so they promote plant growth so they produce um producers like algae to grow okay so the algae multiply quickly and divide and they grow then the algae form something called an algal bloom which is a layer of algae over a lake so very often if you've seen lakes there's like a thick green layer and looks like grass but it's not like a thick green layer of algae over a lake that shields it that shields the organisms in the lake from the light outside so it forms on the layer so yeah algal bloom forms so when this happens it comes to a point where um there are less um, nutrients because the algae has used the nutrients so much there's less nutrients and the algae die okay so the producers die and um, they decompose so decomposers basically like bacteria they go to decompose the algae and they do it aerobically which means they use oxygen so what they do is they use oxygen dissolved oxygen from the water to do this so wh when they do this there's a lack of oxygen in the water and then this cause other marine or aquatic organisms to die because they need oxygen to live as well but then there's a lack of oxygen because the oxygen is being used by decomposers so that is one and also algal bloom algal bloom on the surface of form um, rivers and everything forms a layer right so what happens is it blocks the other organisms inside from light so it blocks photosynthesis as well you should write that so yeah so basically there's a death of organisms requiring dissolved oxygen in water okay now another set of points you have to memorize i'm so sorry but this is just how it is so we have non biodegradable plastics so what exactly are they so they're basically plastics that don't um disintegrate naturally 
they persist in the environment for years. So they either have to be burnt at landfills or they have to be buried. Okay, now, what is the problem with these? One is that they could block digestive systems of animals. So if animals consume these, like if these are on like roads or whatever, or like in habitats just strewn all over, animals are bound to consume that. This could block that digestive system and cause it death, cause organ failure. Visual pollution. So obviously when you look at garbage on land, it's not a pretty sight. So that's visual pollution. Then there could be a lack of tourism. So due to this visual pollution, not many people will want to enter the country for ecotourism. So there's a lack of tourism. Food chains are disrupted, linking to the first point. So if the digestive systems of animals are blocked, then food chains are going to be disrupted. Um, the fumes choke animals. So what fumes are these? So this is basically when plastics are burnt. The fumes that are released could choke animals. Um, Non-biodegradable plastics can also cause vermin and disease, basically. Um, they persist for years as I already said, and they block light for photosynthesis. If strewn over an area with like grass and plants and everything, they block light for photosynthesis so the plants may die. Okay, effects of letting untreated sewage flow into lakes. This is basically the whole process of eutrophication. So eutrophication, plants die, the algae decay by bacteria. These bacteria basically use aerobic respiration to decompose the bacteria. Because of this, there's a lack of oxygen, so other marine animals die. This disrupts the food chain. Okay, that's separate. You can just like draw a little line along the end of the Yeah. And then we have um, waterborne diseases that could occur, visual pollution. Okay, because obviously, yeah. Mutations and feminization that causes a reduced sperm count and an imbalance in population. Okay, now this is a complete question. This is this question is taken from a paper that I found difficult. Like I don't know how to answer this question. So what are the advantages of using biofuel from algae and not crops? So very often you can use as something called like a carbon. Like so basically you can use plants as a way to produce fuel. It's called biofuel. So what is the so some so you can either do it from algae or crop. So what is the advantage of using it? from algae and overcrop. So one is less land is needed because algae is much smaller. The crop can be used for food instead of biofuel, better use of crop. Less deforestation because the crop don't have to be, because algae requires less space, right? Less land is needed. So less deforestation, less trees would be cleared and less disruption to food chains because crop are more vital to food chains as producers than algae are, okay? So memorize these four points. I think it was a two marker question. Okay, now um, the advantages of using biofuels over fossil fuels. I just explained to you what a biofuel is. So yeah, so biofuels help to conserve fossil fuels. Yeah, because if you're using biofuels, then the opportunity cost of that is using fossil fuels. So if you don't have to use fossil fuels, you can conserve fossil fuels. Biofuels are renewable, which means they can be replenished at the same rate of uh, depletion. Plants, okay, so now biofuels are made from plants, right? So now why are plants carbon neutral? Because plants take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and they release carbon dioxide in respiration. So there's no net uh, movement of carbon dioxide. You get it. So it's taken in and given out. Basically, plants use carbon dioxide. Photosynthesis occurs. And then when these are burnt, carbon dioxide is released back into the environment. So there's always going to be a balance of carbon dioxide. Okay. It's less likely to cause acid rain because sulfur deposits won't be there. Less likely to cause global warming because it's natural and less crop waste for energy. Acid rain. Now, what is acid? I just explained to you. So acid rain could be caused one from nitrogen oxides forming in car exhaust engines or from sulfur dioxide forming from um, burning fossil fuels. So when you burn fossil fuels, sulfur may be released, sulfur dioxide may form, sulfur trioxide will form, sulfurous acid will form and acid rain. Um, so what are the effects? Leaching of rivers, mobilizing of aluminium ions, um, lowering lake pH. So it becomes too acidic and when this happens, it's not the optimum pH for aquatic organisms. This could cause in the death of animals okay, or marine life, which could disrupt food chains again. And then, of course, dissolving limestone from buildings. That's not really um, an, um, an ecological effect, but it is an effect. So acid rain is like acidic, right? And limestone is not calcium carbonate. So the acid rain can react with the calcium carbonate, basically, and that could cause limestone buildings to have holes in them, which is not really nice. <laughs> yeah.
So how can you reduce acidine? You can use catalytic converters in cars. So what this does is it converts oxides of nitrogen to nitrogen. Okay, basically this is what happens. So nitrogen oxide could react with carbon monoxide, which is another toxic gas, not acidic, toxic. To form nitrogen and carbon dioxide, which are both less toxic. So even though carbon dioxide does cause the greenhouse effect, it is less toxic than carbon monoxide. And nitrogen is unreactive, so it has no effect, whereas nitrogen monoxide can cause acid rain. Okay, so that is one. So using catalytic converters, then after that, you can use flue gas desulfurization units. It sounds very fancy, but it's not. You can just write FGD. But actually, just write the whole thing. I don't know. I mean, it's been two years since I wrote my, since I did great answer. So, yeah. So basically, these have to convert sulfur dioxide or harmful compounds of sulfur um, and neutralize them. So it uses stuff like calcium oxide or calcium carbonate and reacts with the sulfuric acid or the sulfur dioxide to form calcium sulfate, which is not you know, going to cause acid rain. You can use biofuels instead of fossil fuels, so less sulfur dioxide is formed and less acid rain. Now you can use renewable energy instead of burning fossil fuels. Easy stuff. Okay, the greenhouse effect. What is the greenhouse effect? So, so basically, you know, light is a form of radiation. Light travels to the earth from the sun in wavelengths. So what happens is when it travels to the earth, most of the light is reflected back or radiated back into space. However, there are there's some light that is absorbed by the planet, absorbed by the atmosphere of the planet. And now how is it absorbed by the atmosphere? Due to the presence of gases like carbon dioxide and methane. These kind of absorb, these absorb light, these absorb the heat basically. And this causes the temperature of the earth to rise. That's why the temp over the last century or decade or whatever, the temperature of the earth has been rising due to an increase in the um, release of such gases which absorb the heat. Okay, and this is called the greenhouse effect. Why is it called greenhouse effect? Because this is what happens in a greenhouse. You use a gas like carbon dioxide in the greenhouse to um, absorb heat, okay, to maintain like an optimum temperature. So this is kind of like the greenhouse effect again. Okay, and what happens as a result of the greenhouse effect? Global warming, which is not a good thing. Okay, so now why is carbon dioxide used in a glass house? This is again a Marx scheme answer taken from a paper. One, it promotes photosynthesis because plants use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. It maximizes the rate of photosynthesis. And because it maximizes the rate of photosynthesis, it causes an increase in glucose concentration produced by plants. So an increase in crop yield, which is good. And then we have, um, it prevents carbon dioxide from being, being the limiting factor. So using a surplus of CO2 in a green glass house helps to prevent carbon dioxide from being the factor that stunts plant growth, you know. And yeah, again, because of increased glucose concentration, increased growth. Okay, sustainability, very important topic. These two definitions you have to know. So a sustainable resource like um, renewable energy basically is one which is produced as rapidly as it is removed from the environment. So it does not run out. Like basically it is basically, so it is basically replenished at the same rate um, of consumption. So it doesn't run out. And, and sustainable development is development providing for the needs of an increasing human population without harming the environment. So these two you have to know by heart. I can't even highlight keywords for you because you have to know every word. These, the second definition could come for a max to max three mark answer and the first one for two marks maximum. So you have to know it by heart. Okay, so this, okay, so basically why must non-renewable resources like fossil fuels be conserved? One is because um, when they are burnt, they release like toxic gases in the environment. Two is because they take years to form, but they take only seconds to get depleted. So there's always going to be like um, a shortage of fossil fuels, a shortage of fuels. And so there won't be any develop, like there won't be, um, that there won't be any capacity to provide for an increase in human population if there's going to be a shortage of energy sources. Okay, that's basically it. Um, then conservation. So basically conservation is preserving resources. Okay, so um, why? So now this is taken from your syllabus as well. So basically some resources can be maintained like forests and fish stocks. Okay, products, you have to be able to state the first two, the first three points. Okay, products can be reused or recycled. 
okay basically paper glass plastic and metal so if they give you any example of these materials being used somewhere you have to be able to state that they can be reused or recycled um and um sewage can be treated to make water safe now how is sewage treated there's actually a long drawn process that i want you to go through in your um textbook it's not difficult at all you just have to understand it the fundamentals of it and i've written down the fundamentals of it that is basically chlorination and filtration and um i don't think i, I don't want to waste my time explaining something that's already pretty simple so basically sewage treatment via chlorination what does chlorination do it kills bacteria present in the water and filtration removes physically removes um large pieces of debris or like large papers or waste from the water so filtration is a physical separation and chlorination is chemical okay and um, forests and fish stocks as i so we so first we stated that they can be maintained how can they be maintained and sustained one educating so you can educate poachers educate hunters educate fishermen to not you know overfish or whatever to is legal quotas that is when you set a limit on the amount of fish that can be removed or the amount of fish that can be removed daily or the amount of animals that can be hunted and restocking that is when you restock replenish like the fish with the ocean with fish that's basically it and allow giving giving the um, ocean time like that is when you take breaks from fishing and giving the um, ocean time the aquatic organisms time to re reproduce divide multiply and increase their numbers okay now what are the advantages of conserving ecosystems again mark ski answer one it prevents extinction two it um, promotes biodiversity three it prevents disruption of food chains four it provides habitats five service for humans like you know it is a actual job six eco tourism people come in because of the environment and tourism and seven ethical reasons so you have to memorize these again self explanatory i don't think they require any explanation i put them down so you can screen tot this and memorize this for your seven mark six mark answers okay sustainable development requires management of conflicting demands and planning and cooperation and cooperation at local national and international levels when you sign treaties or anything that is basically when you are like agreeing at an international level so um, again the kyoto protocol the um, paris agreement forgotten the exact name but yeah these things basically require international cooperation um endangerment causes now why are some animals endangered one climate change okay two hunting they can be hunted so their population will reduce three pollution pollution that causes climate change link points again for destruction of habitats so if the habitats are destroyed their food chains are disrupted so how will they basically find nutrients how will they survive in no place basically so that causes them to die and five is introduced species so if you introduce a species into like an island or something that preys on all the other organisms present that would cause endangerment Now the endangerment solution. So one is monitoring and protecting species and habitats. Two is education. Three is captive breeding that we've already been through, and I think the third slide. And four is seed banks. When you have like um, seeds, like a large bank or like a large amount of seeds that are used to replant habitats. Okay, that is the solution. Okay, so what do conservation programs do? They reduce extinction. They protect vulnerable environments. and they maintain ecosystem functions like nutrient cycles and resource provision that's for food drugs fuel and genes so food drugs fuel that component we've done in chapter 20 which is biotech so i expect you to remember that it's pretty easy so whenever they talk about conservation programs you should know fds you drug fuels okay drugs as an antibiotics okay so yeah that was it that was the whole chapter human influences on ecosystems we have officially finished the portion for idcs in biology and i i feel so happy i feel so good cuz you know this has been like hanging for a long time over my head and i'm happy i finally got it done with um if it helped you please comment down below if you want take screenshots of these if you have questions you can email or comment i will respond i will reply as quick as possible i'm on vacation now and if you need any help do the same again email me and if this video helped you please like the video subscribe to my channel and share this channel with your friends let's get through this together